Supreme Court building was the ideal venue for the highlight of Law Week and certainly the imposing atmosphere of the courtroom brought out the best in the teams as the girls of St Catherine's High Singleton attempted to take the trophy from last year's winners, Musselbrook High. Alas, the Musselbrook team showed superior attack and a stronger case to retain the shield by just four points. Law Week Committee liaison chief Bruce Deeds said he had no doubts there were a few up-and-coming lawyers in the race for the debating finalists. The way they argued their case, I'd say a couple of them, yes. They're certainly capable of spreading straws, and if that's what a lawyer's got to do to make a case, they can certainly do it. From early morning, crowds of people began flocking to the harbour foreshore by car, bus and train, and finally on foot. The 40,000-plus crowd all had one thing in mind, to catch a glimpse of the royal the couple, or and possibly present looking... a posy of flowers to the Queen, or chance a casual chat with the Duke. But amid the royalists, about 20 members of the local Awabakal Aboriginal tribe protested quietly with placards in favour of Aboriginal land rights although they became vocal during the official speeches later in the morning. On previous visits to the city, the royal couple had come by either train or plane. Today, the Queen and Prince Philip arrived on board the Britannia. The port turned on a typical maritime welcome to the royal yacht. This plane's majestic way from nobbies really is up one the of those mornings where there is a gr Steaming toward Throsby Wharf, the Britannia silently saluted the vessels of another seagoing era, the sailing craft from the First Fleet reenactment, farewelled by Her Majesty in Portsmouth almost a year ago. The square riggers sailed into Newcastle yesterday for the royal visit. At 11.30, the royal barge cast off from the Britannia to whisk the Queen and Duke through a flotilla of sailing motorised craft downstream to a pontoon of the new Queen's Wharf. To the cheers of tens of thousands, the royal visitors stepped ashore to be greeted by the Premier, Nick Reiner, and the Lord Mayor of Newcastle, Alderman John McNaughton. The Queen chose an emerald jacket over a green and black wool dress, making her way to the silver cloud and holding the door, making her unmistakable among the loyal throng of Novocastrians. A walk to the Royal Rolls Royce for a short trip to the forecourt of the Customs House from where and the Mrs. Queen Morris. opened the $13 million rejuvenated the town clerk, Harbour Barry Lewis, done out the in the full brigade to the official and party. Mrs. Lewis. And the speeches of welcome from the Minister for Transport and Communication Support and Federal Member for waiting, Shortland, Peter Morris, the Her Premier Majesty of and the, the Lord Mayor. And yet some more flowers. The natural there. beauty of the location is being rediscovered with this development and it's being enhanced with landscaping and the planting of thousands of trees. An attractive and vital recreation area will be available in close proximity to the commercial centre of the city, which will be enjoyed by the people of city, the city, the Hunter region, and visitors alike. The foreshore was the site of an early Aboriginal settlement and is where Lieutenant John Shortland landed in 1797. The area has significantly changed since that time because of reclamation of land from the Hunter River and by the development of the city of Newcastle itself. For many years, this part of Newcastle's foreshore was unattractive, run down and generally of little benefit to the people of Newcastle. It's therefore most pleasing that the three levels of government, Commonwealth, State and Local, have combined to produce an amenity for the people of Newcastle that is attractive and functional, especially as it is so close to the central business district. Your Majesty, this parkland, the foreshore, is both the symbol and the reality of our heritage and of the future we want to create for our cities and our citizens. It is with great pride, therefore, that on behalf of the Council and people of Newcastle, I invite Your Majesty to unveil this plaque to mark this event and officially open the foreshore. Her Majesty now unveiling the plaque to officially open Queen's Wharf. 
Thereby During her impromptu Newcastle royal walkabout, the Queen met the former Lord the Mayor of Newcastle, Mrs away. Joy Cummings, whose Amongst dream it was to have the once tatty foreshore redeveloped into a showpiece. The royal couple's guests. slow progress through the milling crowd made them a little late for their next the appointment. Following the official the opening of the foreshore development, the royal couple made their way here to City Hall. Some people had waited outside the hall for Kelly three hours for a three-minute glimpse of Her Majesty and His Royal Highness. They were the crowd, not disappointed when the Lord and Mayor and Street Lady Baller. Mayoress escorted them to the City Hall balcony, like the Royal Couple had done in their first visit to the city in February 1954. Inside, the Royal Couple attended a civic reception and a lavish luncheon. Afterwards, the royal couple travelled by car to Newcastle Regional Museum, where again thousands patiently waited. The Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh were greeted by Family and Community Services Minister Virginia Chadwick and the Deputy Lord Mayor, Alderman Dennis Nichols. The royal couple moved inside the museum for a whirlwind inspection. Their tour included the remnants of green artificial rainforest exhibition. The interior tour complete. The royal couple emerged and took their seats for the official ceremony to open the museum. Alderman Nichols addressed the crowd, and then with media representatives from all over the world looking on, the Queen unveiled the park. Retiring museum director Richard Morgan was obviously ecstatic. This is one of the major events for the museum, and it is certainly a major event in my life and uh, I think that uh, this puts this museum on the international map. With precious minutes ticking away, the royal couple then said their goodbyes to a cheering crowd and headed for the Williamtown RAAF base to make their departure. Ross Hampton takes up the story. Tonight we'll bring you a story on the Royal Yacht Britannia's departure from Newcastle. Well wishes waved from the shore this morning as the magnificent vessel steamed out of the harbour bound for Britain. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. until midday Friday to agree to the plan, which, although it goes against the general award, has been agreed to by the Coal Industry Tribunal. The Labor Council called Thursday's meeting at the request of the Colliery Staff Association and the Mr. The association is not affiliated with the five combined mining units. The General Secretary of the Colliery Staff Association, Bob Gowson, says it has acted to try and save the jobs of its 103 members at the three collieries concerned which will close if the BHP deal falls through. The, the facts are so unique in this situation as to render it almost inconceivable to think that it could be repeated. I mean, BHP wants to go through West Wall's End workings and eventually mine its own coal at Wakefield. Now that is a unique set of circumstances, requires unique thinking, and it really means that if we're going to save jobs, we're going to have to look at what we've been saying and perhaps revise. I mean, it's a changing time, and it's time that the Northern Liaison Committee started thinking about the need to change, to maintain an economy that works, and not an economy that continues to fall apart. After three years and almost $12 million, the Burwood Outfall project is close to completion. This tunnel extends almost two kilometres out to sea, deep under the ground. Ten shafts run vertically from the line up to the ocean floor 50 metres above, where steel plates keep the water out until the workers are finished. 
If an anchor on a power winch snagged one of those covers, thousands of litres of water would thunder down the one metre diameter shaft into the main line. Workers could be hurt and machinery destroyed. Project manager Hans Bluler says the cost would be staggering. We can't do any repairs while water is rushing into the tunnel. Marine works would have to be remobilized. All up total would be in excess of a million dollar damages to... The Maritime Services Board has made it an offence to drop anchor near the Burwood project and warning boys also advise vessels to steer clear. Even so, some amateur fishermen have ignored the instructions. Last weekend, one fisherman snagged an anchor over the restricted zone and had to cut the line. The shaft covers were unharmed, but the water board spent thousands of dollars an hour for an inspection of the seabed by divers. The divers also reported that fishing in those waters was not significantly better despite local opinion. Engineers say work on the outfall will be finished in September or October when boat owners will be able to fish as they please. Crosby Creek Wickham, and in a waterside warehouse, Newcastle's contribution to the space race takes shape. The smooth, sleek lines of the unidentified stationary object are suggestive of flight. The only other craft of these exact dimensions resides at NASA. Last year, local firm Austral High Tech won a lucrative contract to build this full-scale replica of the American Space Shuttle Discovery. The company was formed three years ago, specialising in the construction of large-scale models. Discovery is their biggest project so far. Indeed, this is the only full-scale model of the shuttle in the world. The 30-metre structure weighs 40 tonnes and is worth several hundred thousand dollars. A hand-picked team of tradesmen made its steel frame, then covered the skeleton with plywood and fibreglass. Every complicated curve of the original shuttle has been faithfully reproduced a task which demanded the skills of shipwrights like Ted Morgan. You're creating something with your hands and all the rest of it, right? It's, you're back to basic skills. It's not like being in a big workshop where you've got hoops and hoops of machinery and all that. You're back to basic skills. The team is preparing to break the shuttle down into 16 pieces for shipment to Japan, where it will take pride of place at a science show. Austral High Tech estimates 7 million people will see the craft during its first six months in Japan. And they'll be seeing more than the mammoth shell. The interior of the model is an 80-seat theatrette, where a 10-minute film simulates flight, complete with roaring speakers and shaking seats. And that's about as close as most would-be astronauts will come to a real dog. And now we begin our main mission. The doors open to the payload bay which is exactly where you're sitting right now. When 34-year-old Larry Mahoney drove his pickup truck into the bus, police say he had a blood alcohol content of .24, more than twice the legal limit for driving drunk. An arrest warrant has been issued. Uh, the officer is at the hospital arresting uh, Mr. Mahoney at this time. At the morgue, the identification process continues, and the state medical examiner said if it hadn't been for the fire after the impact, everyone would have survived. Of course, it's, it's horrendous that, uh, that people died from, from, from flame injury and from smoke inhalation who were not incapacitated in any other way physically. 
The accident is also raising concerns about the use of school buses on long highway trips. The average school bus weighs about half that of a commercial coach, and some safety experts say that the older foam rubber seats burn too easily. In a front-end collision in a school bus, the emergency exit is the door in the back. In a commercial coach, there are two exits in the roof, and every other window pops out. America's most popular spectator sport. While still in its infancy in Australia, it is also gaining a following here, with competitions in most states. However, it is a complex team game, and enthusiasts take many years to master its intricacies. That's where Craig McCord and George McCormack come in. They are American coaches brought to Australia for several months by the New South Wales Football Gridiron League to instruct the fledgling teams. While in this state, they are running coaching clinics and training sessions. Last night, it was the Newcastle Cobras' turn to benefit from their experience. There you go. It's better keep working to get it right up here. So it's up and out. Left blast. The 28 players have been training twice a week for 18 months. In July, they'll become the 14th and first non-metropolitan team neck. to be included in the New South Wales right. Gridiron League competition. Okay. According Down to again. quarterback Brad Josie, Gridiron is the most demanding football Set. code. Cut! Lift him up! Come on, push him! He's on his back! Good stuff! This guy is a lot more competitive. Demands a lot more skill. Rub the leg. There's no control on the ball. BHP intended buying Westwall's End from Coal and Allied, but now that deal has fallen through and the colliery has ceased production. Today at a National Mining Union meeting in Sydney, BHP gave its answer to a proposal that a 50% bonus cut at its mines be used to finance a $10,000 extra incentive for employees to voluntarily leave the industry. This in turn, said the unions, would allow room for men retrenched from Westwall's End last year to have their jobs back, thus maintaining the seniority entitlement held so sacred by the workers. Late today, the general manager of BHP Collieries Division, Jim Lewis, said the proposal was rejected for two main reasons, the first being that it's not new and had already been ruled out. It is, in fact, uh, a suggestion that was canvassed before the Coal Industry Tribunal and was rejected. The second reason, uh, the new component to it, is the offer for the employees to fund the scheme, essentially. And uh, our concerns there, which have led to us rejecting it, are that the critical, the critical factor in a mine is to get the production up. And one way in which that is encouraged is to give the miners an incentive by way of bonus to increase productivity and production. If you cut bonus, you cut at the very heart of the viability of the mine. Smiley's move from Sydney to Salabanda Bay follows the development of the Roach Racket Resort by Tony Roach. When the centre opens next month, Liz will be its touring professional and Peter the resort's director. On current rankings, Liz is number three in Australia and number 60 in the world. However, her true talent lies in playing doubles where she is ranked number five in the world. Liz's major tournament victories to date include the Wimbledon Doubles Championship with Kathy Jordan in 1985 and the US Mixed title with fellow Aussie John Fitzgerald. In two weeks, Liz heads to England where she hopes to win a second Wimbledon title. It would be nice. The trophy cabinet will even it up if I get another one, you know, the same on the other side. But uh, Wimbledon's always, to me, it's the biggest tournament in the world and it's always special to go back there and play. And um, in the past, I've always seemed to have played well there, so hopefully I'll keep it up. And you're teaming up with Cathy Jordan again? Yes, I'm playing with Cathy. Um, we haven't played at Wimbledon since we won, so it'll be a nice feeling to uh, 
play with her there again. Wimbledon isn't the only title Liz has her sights on. The 25-year-old is a member of the Australian team for the Olympics where tennis is being played for the first time. She'll be playing singles and pairing up with Wendy Turnbull in the doubles. While it was a good victory for the locals, the Sydney combination led for most of the game. After some bad kicking early in the match, Newcastle trailed 4-10 to Sydney's 6-4 at half-time. However, Newcastle really put it together in the last 10 minutes when Sydney led by 8 points. At this stage, four quick goals secured the game for the locals. Best for the victors was Dane Edwards, while Jim Hardy and Pat White kicked three goals each. It's the first time the squad has played together this season, and the last before they head to Coffs Harbour for the New South Wales Country Championships on the 4th and 5th of June. Newcastle is hoping to retain the title, which they lost to North Coast in last year's country final. In the news tonight, Sydney adventurer Kay Cotty only has to sail 800 nautical miles to become the first woman to complete a solo, non-stop circumnavigation of the world. After 180 lonely days, she saw her native land again for the first time today. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. Good afternoon, I'm Belinda Borisow. Tonight I'll be reporting on a unique new art exhibition opening tonight in Newcastle. Although painted this year, the works are typical of the traditional American style of the 1890s. For all the news, join us tonight at 6.